purposes. Syndicated columnist Cal Thomas moderates this forum, looking at what some say are examples of political correctness in classrooms. Panelists include author Dinesh D'Souza, Young America's Foundation President Ron Robinson, and Amy Holmes of the Independent Women's Forum. It's about a half hour. Hello, and welcome to the launch of the Center for Print and Broadcast Media in Arlington, Virginia. I'm Cal Thomas. As part of the Center's inaugural activities, the first Campus Journalism Awards were given out this morning. Over 200 entries from college students across the country were submitted, and we are joined now by two winners. Kyle Harper of the University of Oklahoma is here, representing his paper, The Fountainhead, the winner of this year's Best New Publication Award. Also a winner today, Baird Alice of the University of Chicago. Baird is the winner of the Best Editorial Award, and he writes for the Chicago Criterion. Conservative papers on college campuses, who would have ever thought? Dinesh D'Souza, we were just talking before uh, we started this uh, program. I first met you as one of the co-conspirators of the uh, politically incorrect Dartmouth Review up there in uh, wonderful New Hampshire. How have things progressed or regressed for conservative newspapers on campus since you were uh, part of that publication in the early 80s? Well, we were part of the emerging uh, Reagan generation. We were uh, excited by, we have had a sense that the world was changing and we wanted to be part of that. And uh, we saw the, um, that there had been a kind of liberal orthodoxy established on the campus. Uh, one in which many issues were, were taboo. They were kept outside the realm of acceptable debate. Uh, and yet what they were the issues that got to the heart of what it meant to have a liberal education. Who gets into college? What are the books that you read to be an educated person? And uh, so our uh, campus paper was sort of devoted to questioning and even attacking some of these orthodoxies. And it didn't make the deans too happy. Well, let's see uh, how it plays out in the 90s. Now, Dinesh, uh, gentlemen, was one of the founding fathers of the conservative newspaper revolution on uh, on campuses. So how goes it at the end of uh, the 1990s? Uh, are conservative ideas uh, more widely accepted? Are conservative uh, publications um, uh, more widely accepted on your campuses? Well, I think that there's a, uh, a growing need um, sensed by the students for a conservative uh, publication on campus. I think that more and more people are uh, starting to see that uh, perhaps some of the things that they've been told aren't quite as true as, as, as was said. Um, and so I think that there is there's the response to that through conservative papers. Um, obviously, there are you know obstacles that you face, uh, apathy on campus, um, hostility from other students, um, students burning your paper, students throwing your paper away. Things like that are uh, are a real problem for uh, for anybody trying to to uh, start a new publication. And you know we see that every day. Carl, you're at uh, the University of Oklahoma. Oklahoma generally regarded as a uh, conservative state. Uh, things better for you there than what you hear from other campuses around the country? Probably with the students, although I'd venture to say that the liberal orthodoxy that Mr. D'Souza spoke of is definitely very strong where I come from. I'd say that the faculty and administration at OU are much to the left of the student body, which kind of creates an interesting dynamic because a lot of the students really appreciate us and a lot of the faculty and administration. Uh, a lot of it does and a lot of it doesn't really care for us too much. Ron Robinson, one of the uh, things that your organization does and extremely well because I hear about it wherever I go when I do campuses is provide uh, conservative speakers for college campuses. Is there a, uh, a, an openness to this or are you still encountering some of the resistance that some of us did in the 80s? Well, it's a different kind of resistance. Students are eager to hear conservative speakers. They want to hear conservative ideas and they're packing auditoriums across the country to hear these speakers. The resistance comes from the faculties and the administrators. Uh, there's so many instances of that at the universe, uh, St. Louis University earlier this year. The administration uh, precipitously canceled a Dan Quayle lecture saying that Quayle might run for president, and indeed he might. But across town, uh, Bill Bradley was speaking as an officially sponsored speaker at a college and university. So that is unfortunately somewhat typical of what we're seeing in divisions today. Students eager to hear conservative ideas coming out to hear conservative speakers, faculty and administrators, uh, the, the remnant, remnant, if you will, of uh, 
the new left in the late 1960s is trying to stop students from hearing conservative ideas. Amy, it would seem that uh, nothing is more politically correct on college campuses these days than the feminist worldview, women's studies. Uh, a friend of mine went to Randolph-Macon some years ago and said that they had a debate in, in an entire classroom on whether it was sexist for a woman to allow a man to open a door for her. <laughs> Uh, I said, they're paying top dollar for this sort of thing? What, what is the uh, state uh, of the female disunion, if you will, on college campuses today? Are conservative ideas uh, making progress among women? I think they absolutely are, that there's actually kind of a boredom with the campus feminists, that they represent this extreme left-wing group that a lot of students just, they don't even know where their women's center is. So this has opened the opportunity for conservative women to have their voices heard, to speak to mainstream women, and in fact, I work with some young women at Georgetown, Yale, Smith, and other colleges, and we welcome, we welcome the sort of the trashing of these ideas because it shows how intolerant and extreme the other side is. We had a fundraiser for the first campus pub uh, conservative women's publication at Georgetown, and a group of women um, who organized themselves as the lesbian Avengers decided that they would be most effective uh, picketing this. Th well, first they wanted to crash into the event without paying the, the nominal student fee. And we said, listen, if you pay your 10 bucks, you can come in and do whatever you want. But they didn't want to do that. So then they decided to kiss and grope each other in front of everybody. And we're like, look, you're blocking the entrance. If you want to do that outside, that's perfectly acceptable. But for us, it just, it just highlighted the fact that these women are totally intolerant of anybody, you know, even a step to the right of them. That, and it's good for our cause. Mm. Boy, positive, advancing. I like to hear that. Oh, nobody's, in, nobody's into defeat. This is tremendous. We want to recognize all the colleges and universities who were winners in the first Campus Journalism Awards. They are the University of Chicago, Dartmouth College, Baylor University, the University of Iowa, Wabash College, Brandeis University, the University of Oregon, Northwestern University, Harvard, and the 1999 New Publication Award winner went to the Fountainhead at the University of Oklahoma. And congratulations to all of the winners. Dinesh, I want to pick up on something, again, we were talking about before the program. Uh, a lot of racial politics in this country. People continue to exploit the race and class warfare uh, for their own political benefit. You wrote a book, very controversial, uh, had you on some of my programs talking about it, The End of Racism. Uh, Charles Murray wrote The Bell Curve, uh, disturbing conclusions uh, about the uh, intellectual uh, capability of uh, certain members of our society. And then just the other day, uh, the New York Times uh, had a uh, front page story in which it said that uh, African Americans from wealthy backgrounds, middle class to wealthy backgrounds, did not score as well as poor whites from poor family backgrounds. What conclusions do you draw from that? Well, in some ways, you begin by acknowledging that the, the liberal premise of the 60s, which was embodied in the civil rights movement, was that in some ways, if you have anti-discrimination laws, uh, and as minority groups become middle class, uh, they will, in a sense, uh, the problem will shift from race to class. And so, for example, the expectation was that um, the children of these families would all do equally well. It's been a disturbing and somewhat shocking conclusion that Asians and whites from poor families um, uh, do far better on tests, including math tests, uh, than upper middle class African Americans. This has been a, uh, something that the academic community has been, has been wrestling with. I don't think that the so-called bell curve explanation, the genetic view, is right. Um, I think that it assumes too much. It's too easy an explanation. I think that my own answer, very briefly, is that most immigrant um, communities have taken two or three generations to enter the middle class. Uh, and you can think of Mario Cuomo's grandfather coming as a cobbler, and Mario Cuomo's father goes to City College of New York, and Cuomo becomes the governor. For African Americans, the history is unique. In the 60s, with the Watts riots and the distur civil disturbances, many Americans said, we have to have a black middle class and we have to have it now. And a lot of programs, great society programs, affirmative action programs, were expanded to create this black middle class, and it's been quite successful. We have a black middle class. 
but I would argue it is an economic middle class and not yet a cultural middle class. So I think it, it will take a little more time for the cultural habits, if you will, uh, to develop that will neutralize some of these differences. So I actually have a hopeful view of it. But, but ironically, what to me is surprising is none of this can really even be debated. Uh, you have to attribute these things to societal discrimination. And the discrimination is not obvious. I mean, how could racism make poor whites and Asians do better on a math test than an upper middle class African American? When the racism is not evident, it has to be inferred. It's not overt, so it's got to be covert. And so we're driven into ever more ridiculous conjectures. I, I think a little more honesty would go a long way toward making this, to lowering the temperature and having a better discussion. Amy, before we got to the uh, politically correct era in which we now live, uh, colleges and universities used to be about imparting ideas and wisdom and knowledge. And now, beginning with freshman guides, uh, in a lot of our colleges and universities, it's clearly a kind of uh, propaganda re-education camp that if these kids didn't get it by the time they graduated from their high school, it's going to be drummed into them uh, through peer pressure, through uh, co-ed dorms, through uh, gay and lesbian studies, and it begins during orientation in some of these freshman guides. Tell us about uh, how outrageous they have become. Well, what our guy tried to do was to uh, inject a little truth into the discussion that uh, one of the authors remembers her freshman year being told in a group of women that you know one in eight of you is going to be a victim of rape before you graduate from this university and she was afraid she was afraid of her male peers she was afraid of walking alone on campus and she looked at her other female friends thinking which one of you is it going to be me is it going to be you but that this was all completely uh, exaggerated for effect and what these women are saying is that women don't need to be told lies in order to protect themselves and in fact these kinds of lies about what's going to happen to you at this campus obscures the ways that you can protect yourself most effectively for example, we know, you can go look at on the website for the American Medical Association, that alcohol plays a big factor in sexual assault or simply sexual miscommunication between mm -hmm. male and female students. And unfortunately, the Women's Center doesn't talk about that, because then what that means is that women are in a position to protect themselves without the help of the Women's Center, that they know that part, part of the problem is going out on the weekends and getting wasted and going home with somebody that they don't know very well and that they haven't, haven't done their work. And for example, with the uh, date rape drug, mm. this was something that was you know, just an absolute uh, crisis on the college campuses. And then when we looked into it from the DC Rape Crisis Center, the the number of sexual assaults involving substance, substances and involving rohypnol, this drug, mm. were tiny. It was a tiny, tiny fraction. But the manufacturers, Hoffman LaRoche, have reformulated this drug so it's now blue when it's put into a liquid. But again, the Women's Center doesn't put this information out because they want to keep these women in a constant state of hysteria. Ron, uh, looking at the uh, commencement speakers this year, uh, C-SPAN uh, did a, a series of them. Uh, they called me up and said, hey, we don't, we don't know too many conservatives. Uh, are you uh, speaking anywhere this year? I said, yeah, Covenant College in uh, Lookout Mountain, uh, Georgia, on the Tennessee border. And so, okay, well, we're going to come and cover you. So I was one of only four that we've been able to count conservative speakers uh, at major colleges and universities. Uh, there were dozens, scores from the other side, from Kofi Annan to Madeleine Albright, uh, Cokie Roberts of ABC, Rick Kaplan, the uh, socialist president of CNN, uh, Bill Richardson, uh, who has uh, operated Los Alamos like a Chinese restaurant. Uh, I mean, wh what is the problem here with this, and what can be done to overcome it and allow uh, at least a fair and balanced number of conservative speakers to come to these campuses? Well, the problem is, is university officials control commencements for the most part. I thought it, that was student-initiated. It, it can be in some cases. But even there, oftentimes, the administrators will override it. That was my experience when I graduated from law school, mm -hmm. and I see it around the country. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, Clinton administration apologists are getting the top billing. After that, media officials, uh, particularly left-wing media commentators, uh, and then prominent Democratic elected officials, uh, the president and the vice president uh, leading that group. What you're not seeing is uh, any sense of balance anywhere in the country in that respect. I'm glad that uh, you spoke in Tennessee, uh, but commencements are not a new beginning for college students. Commencements are one last uh, opportunity for the administration to give them uh, left-wing orthodoxy. Yeah. Well, um, how do you fix that? I mean, uh, do, do alumni uh, say, look, 
uh, who are conservative? Do they say we're going to withhold some contributions? That gets their attention in a hurry. It does. I think students need to speak out on it more. It's not just um, the imbalance there. I mean, it's, it's really stark when you think of people like uh, Supreme Court Justice Thomas and Scalia and Rehnquist not giving commencements, a Nobel laureate like Milton Friedman not giving a commencement, uh, when you start going to uh, even conservative media personalities like George Will, who I think has shown up once in the top 50 schools in the last five years. You need to uh, expose this, you need to have students protest it, and you need for contributors and alumni to say, hey, when a school like Yale has three or four Clinton cabinet officials it has the Democratic mayor of uh, Baltimore. It uh, has Henry Winkler, the actor. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last five, seven years, they have not had a c single conservative give a commencement address. Mm -hmm. It's time for some sense of balance. Dinesh, uh, I thought we had uh, ended these uh, incidents in the 80s <coughs> when, when Jean Kirkpatrick was disinvited from uh, uh, a university to give a speech because some people uh, thought she was too conservative when uh, Barbara Bush uh, was, uh, they attempted to disinvite her from Wellesley College, but she brought Rice and Gorbachev along, so they allow her to come. Uh, when I was shouted down at Smith College in the early 80s, a bunch of lesbians sat in the front row kissing each other and holding hands during my entire address, which was an educational experience for me. But you, uh, more recently, had had an experience with Ward Connerly at uh, Columbia University. Tell us about it. We were there to uh, take part in the conference, and uh, Connolly spoke first and apparently attracted, um, or repelled, I should say, a large group of protesters who were there to shout him down. And the university claimed to get very nervous, and uh, the next day uh, I was supposed to speak, and they said if Connolly got 200 protesters, D'Souza will get 400. And so they canceled my talk, which I eventually had to kind of give in the lawn somewhere. But my, my thinking is that... She's you know, on grass. Now, that's a great <laughs> headline. I like that. My, my thinking about this is, is I don't feel defensive about all this because my feeling is that they are, they are afraid of conservative views and, and they're right to be afraid. See, this is a generation of uh, faculty, uh, these activists in the 60s, uh, um, they had a vision of the world. They and were occupying the administration building in the 60s, now they're in the administration building in the 90s with the same world view, right? Yes, but at a time when they felt that the world was going their way. They thought at one time that... Uh, guerrilla socialist revolutions would take over the world, that capitalism's contradictions would become apparent, uh, that the West would be in retreat. Uh, and they are now stunned by world developments and they can't do anything. They're living in a global economy. They can't put the Berlin Wall back up. They can't put the Sandinistas back to power in Nicaragua. The best they can do is take over the English department. And, and so... Right, and there's something I want to add to that. And in fact, in terms of winning student support, as we heard b earlier, they're losing. The UCLA... Uh, survey of freshmen uh, found that political apathy is at an all-time low. More students are registering independent, that this liberal orthodoxy, as we're calling it, on the college campus is really just driving people out of politics. So it's no, not wait, so inviting is, is independence then a, a way station on the way to conservatism? Or, or uh, the apathy is a bad thing. That's really worse, isn't it, than engagement? At, at least if you have a liberal engaged in, in political activism, you can meet them on that plane and debate the ideas. But if they're apathetic, if they've dropped out, if they only care about making tons of money and don't care about what's going on in their state capitals or in their nation's capital, isn't that a problem for conservatives as well? Well, I think we do have to look at it in terms of a way station and that conservatives have to find the issues that the students care about, that they want to discuss, that they don't want to go see some shout fest with a bunch of, you know, radical leftist protesters. Crossfire on steroids. Right, sure. They, yeah. it's, well, it's not interesting. It's boring. And it's boring to reduce human beings to three categories, class, race, and gender. Hmm. And it surprises me that it comes out of the English department, a place where you're supposed to be investigating, you know, human imagination and the human condition through literature, through the centuries through the millennia and these students I think are responding maybe you can speak to this and just sort of shutting it off because the liberal voices are so loud and at this point conservatives have to sort of find where it is that they can talk to students on on what they care about well let's ask our students here we've got them here is this uh, is any of this are you do you relate to any of this is re is this real life are these issues being discussed on your campuses sure is I was talking to our cartoonist before uh, we filmed here and she's an English lit major you're a cartoonist. Do you want to explain that so people the, will think you're not the, reading comic <coughs> books at the University right, of Oklahoma? The, the cartoonist for the newspaper oh, is, okay, a, good. is an English lit major, and she talked about how when she first entered the English lit department, she thought it'd be like high school, writing about some stories that she'd read. and Shakespeare, Beowulf. Right, right. And when she got there, it ended up 
you know, after you get enough hours that it's too late to switch, mm. they start throwing you into telling you things like gender as a construct and these crazy things that, that they've done since they've hijacked English departments. And I think that, that they are losing it. The University of Oklahoma, they have a rule that to keep a major, it has to have at least 10 students, 12.5 students enrolled in it. 12.5? On average. <laughs> And, uh, well, that's the gender deconstruction. That is right. Right, yeah. right. And uh, they, they found out that the women's studies program at OU only had 10 students. So within the next couple of years, it could face elimination. It probably won't, but it's pretty obvious what's going on there, that a, that a small segment of the faculty and the extreme left students are going to try and rally to save this department that the vast majority of students won't waste their education dollars on. Baird, University of Chicago uh, Law School certainly uh, has a history of uh, liberalism. How is it for you there? Do you feel like a fish out of water, a conservative young man in the University of Chicago? Well, oftentimes you do feel like a fish out of water, but I think that's to be expected. Um, you know, I think Chicago is one of the more liberal campuses in the country. And, uh, but I think Chicago is also blessed, uh, really, uh, for campuses in this country, at least with the, uh, the sense of openness and the, the ability to express ideas openly. And I think that that is something that is in some ways unique to Chicago, the ability to you know, express ideas without the kind of university pressure to put that down. And so we've been very lucky. How does that work out in the dynamic of a classroom? Uh, you hear a lot of stories about uh, professors and your peers uh, in, in a classroom intimidated, if not into silence, then going along with a party line in order not to be ridiculed. There are many professors we hear and many universities around the country that seek out conservative religious students to hold them up as examples of what's wrong with America, intolerant, bigoted, trying to create a theocracy, who believes in God anymore, you're an idiot. Now, do you, do you encounter any of that? I, I think that that is always to be encountered in, in higher education, but I think that what you see more and more of is uh, younger faculty members, um, newer PhDs, um, people in the junior faculty positions who are, uh, are really becoming more and more uh, openly either conservative or unwilling to put forth the orthodoxy that's, that's been accepted by higher education. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. And it, it has, at least for me, become fairly obvious that that's the case. All right. We're going to outlive the uh, tie-dye and uh, harmony and understanding Age of Aquarius set. That's, that's not bad. Now, let's talk about some of these issues. Been some stuff in the paper recently. Uh, maybe this is the last vestige of what, uh, what these gentlemen were talking about. State of New Jersey. Uh, the New Jersey Lower House, appropriately named, apparently, passed a bill requiring students to recite two sentences from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Most educated people know that. But there have been protests about this. The idea of referring to a creator is a, is a uh, cynical attempt to get prayer back in the public schools. And the use of Mr. Jefferson's word men is sexist. And since some of these people were slave owners, it's also racist, like the Confederate flag reminds us when we used to own one another. Uh, is this uh, legitimate debate something to be taken seriously, or should we all ridicule it on the Letterman and uh, Leno shows and go about our business? Well, I would say, that, I mean, it's, these protests are, are ridiculous. Uh, if we want to, if they want to get into those issues, that the classroom is the place to do it. That we can discuss the fact that these people, you know, our founding fathers were slave owners, and uh, Dinesh, I've read some of your pieces on this fact, and we can discuss it, I think, intelligently as educated people, but not get into this contest of censorship. But I think they're trying to drive out religious speech in the classroom. I mean, it really began with the Supreme Court decision in 1962. Um, it was, in a sense, the early phases of political correctness. It no longer is a level playing field on the college campuses. I mean, the Ron Rosenberger's case that went to the Supreme Court and he barely won allowed his organization at the University of Virginia uh, to distribute uh, Christian newspapers, something that was already done by all the other uh, religious groups on the college campuses and, and done certainly by the atheist groups. So conservatives are simply asking for a level playing field in these schools. And this is an attempt by the New Jersey legislature uh, to move in that direction. I mean, we have driven uh, religion and God and the Ten Commandments out of our schools, and inevitably they were replaced by a left-wing political orthodoxy and the type of situation we recently went through in Colorado. The, right. The, call, the key of all of the, to all of this is, uh, is the courts, is it not? It began really this modern-day hostility to not only religion but what's been called traditional values with a 1947 
Everson case in which the Supreme Court said that what the federal government was prohibited from doing, that is establishing a state church, the states were also prohibited from doing, even though they had state churches well, well into the 19th century, many of the states. And then that came to be taken as a uh, directive of the secularization of the public square, or as Richard John Newhouse uh, wrote in his book, uh, the naked public square. Uh, so the courts are really the key, aren't they? If, we go if we're going to really reestablish academic freedom at all levels, if we're going to reestablish the kind of free speech that even allows conservative and religious people to have their say in the public square, and the universities are supposedly as public as any other part of the square, we've got to do something about the courts, don't we? Part of it is also just uh, a deep uh, ignorance of history. When people mm -hmm. attack the founders and so on, they, they often don't realize it's the institution of slavery. Uh, existed in every civilization. Uh, it, it was almost coeval with man. Uh, the, um, the Chinese had slavery. There was slavery in India. American Indians had slavery before Columbus. And the great mystery is not slavery, which for many people was like the family. I mean, slavery had no critics. Because it didn't even need um, uh, critics because it, it, was, it was accepted. Uh, the mystery is, in a way, not that um, the founders owned slaves, but why a slave owner, Jefferson, would write the Declaration of Independence, uh, articulating a principle that would seem to run against his own self-interest, uh, really the opposite of what people say about the founders, uh, and setting into motion a train of events. You know, Martin Luther King says, you, you know, um, centuries later, I have a promissory note, mm -hmm. and I'm submitting it to be cashed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a racist might say, what note? I, I didn't give you any note. Where, where, what? And the promissory note he's referring to was the very Declaration of Independence. So in a sense, King is saying, I am in an American tradition. I'm not asking for anything un-American. America's a great club. I just want to be a member. Mm -hmm. And I'm appealing to the universality of American principles. So the, uh, these great liberationist ideas that the civil rights movement appealed to are now seen in a kind of idiot view of history mm -hmm as being a subversion of liberty well, instead of an enhancement of it. It's interesting because I took a course on the Atlantic slave trade and unfortunately my professor, and this is an advanced course in economics at Princeton University, has to tell the classroom I am not endorsing slavery by having this class. You know, and I was sort of sitting there like, you don't need to say this to me. I took this class because I am interested in this subject, obviously, mm -hmm. and I have some stake in it, and I want to learn more about it. But then it, to go out and to discuss it and to discuss that, well, in fact, Africans on the continent owned slaves, and they traded willingly with uh, the, the white imperialists, mm -hmm. that is so taboo. But it seems to me that the other students in this class, they're not interested in the tab in the this being a taboo subject they're interested in learning the facts and that's where i think that the liberals are going to lose because the facts are so much more interesting than this story that they've written amy and ron we only got a couple of minutes here i want to end Dinesh, uh, just a comment on it seems to me that conservative students going into many of these traditionally liberal universities or at least modern traditionally liberal if that's not a contradiction are better prepared you have these freshman guides they know what they're getting into they know what to encounter many of them it's not a surprise when they when they uh, meet some of this orthodoxy coming down from the older professors anyway tell us how you're preparing particularly young women with, through the independent women's forum if they choose to go to some of these universities so their their history their faith their values are not dissected in their freshman year Right. Well, what our freshman guides uh, strive to do is that they were the outgrowth of the students themselves. We were approached by women from Georgetown to say, can you please help us? Help us in trying to discuss our views, to get a form out there. And we said, absolutely. What a privilege that you're coming to us. This is, this is really fantastic. And after that, then women at Yale, they had seen the guy. They thought it was very interesting. And uh, the editor was, is, was actually at the time uh, a a member of the Yale Women's Center and so she had she saw both sides and she said my side is not getting out there and I want to be able to sort of be a bridge here so what we're doing is through these guides giving these women an opportunity to go in a different route and it's conservative and some of it is uh, kind of I would say even squishy mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> But one of the topics that we have found that these, these women are just flocking to is the issue of dating. Mm. That what they get from their women's center is that, you know, you're not really female, that's a gender construction, and you should have these androgynous relationships. And they're saying, that's not what I want. Mm. That's not what I want at all. And now this is their form to discuss that. It seems very innocuous. Very quickly. Dating. Positive, ne negative, it's a washout. Next 15 years, campus is going to be better, worse, the same. Mm, I think it's going to be better. Ron, what do you Better think? because of the students. Okay. Dinesh? The, uh, 
the, the, uh, the activists of the 60s are getting older. The actuarial tables are on our side. All right, great. Thanks very much to all of you for being my guest, and uh, appreciate your insights. To get in